definitely know that. The, um, I want to welcome everybody, and I want to thank the New York Stock Exchange for providing tonight's venue for our 48th annual members meeting that is celebrating the 35th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and China. In many ways, as we sit here, the listing of Chinese companies over the last 20 years has come to symbolize how close the United States and China have become economically. 35 years ago, it's safe to say none of us foresaw over a hundred, almost 100 Chinese companies would be listed on the New York Stock Exchange with a market capitalization in excess of $1 trillion. I want to thank Duncan Niederauer and his team at the New York Stock Exchange for their continuing generosity to the National Committee. They also, of course, host our economic forecast, which is the first week of January each year, which is an economic forecast about China's economy. They also allowed the ambassadors Carla, Jan, and I to ring the closing bell today. And I would note that the exchange, that the uh, Dow Jones Industrial was up almost 160 points. <laughs> and I attribute it to these five people. But seriously, when you look at these five former ambassadors, you can understand why, at least in part why, the U.S.-China relationship has prospered over these 35 years. Each has made an extraordinary contribution to shaping the U.S.-China relationship and, his, and in their own right has been an American success story before each became ambassador. Win Lord, one of America's greatest diplomats who crossed into China seconds before Henry Kissinger did, was ambassador from 1985 to 1989. State Roy, one of America's greatest sinologists, reached the rank of career ambassador in the Foreign Service, which is an extreme rarity, and was ambassador from 1991 to 1995. Joe Prier was a four-star admiral and commander of our Pacific forces before serving as our ambassador from 1999 to 2001. John Huntsman was governor of Utah, deputy United States trade representative, and ambassador to Singapore before serving as our ambassador from 2009 to 2011. Last but certainly not least, Gary Locke was governor of the state of Washington and Secretary of Commerce before serving as ambassador from 2011 to early this year. Each was uniquely qualified to make a difference in the most important bilateral relationship America has, and we all agree they did make a difference. Since we last convened five years ago, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations, we've lost one former ambassador, Jim Lilly, and we mourn his lost wisdom. Jim Sasser, and, Jim Sasser and Sandy Rant couldn't be with us today. In addition to all of their extraordinary accomplishments, each of these ambassadors are, or in Wynne's case, were, members of the Board of Directors of the National Committee. I thank you for your service to our country, and I thank you for your support of the National Committee. Let me start the questioning with a question which you've gone online, if you've gone online and watched the last time I did this and interviewed the ambassadors, I asked them to talk about their high point and their low point of their ambassadorship. When? If you would start that off, I would much appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. I'd like to say that the high point was winning the diplomatic doubles tennis tournament. <laughs> uh, but the, there's two problems with that. Number one, our opponents were not very strong. Number two, my partner was Steve Orleans, <laughs> who is a terrific tennis player. It's a bit of like mating 
Woody Allen and Roger Federer. So, <laughs> uh, but seriously, I was very fortunate in my timing uh, in Beijing. I got there in the mid '80s. The Taiwan issue had been pretty well uh, put aside for a while. President Reagan had been there, and I left just before Tiananmen Square broke out. I was one week into the demonstration at Hu Yobang's funeral. So during our tenure, I can't think of one hot out. I'll tick off about six or seven very quickly, then I'll go to the low light. But we, I think we managed both to deepen our balancing act with Moscow without being antagonistic, and begin to lay the foundations for a relationship beyond anti-Soviet glue, which is going to be required, of course, within a couple of years after I left with the fall of the Berlin Wall, because we no longer had that factor. So to tick off the highlights and the variety, and I'll do it very quickly, the first naval ship visits to Qingdao since 1949 from America, a meeting secretly with the intelligent chiefs of both countries to cooperate in providing arms to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, uh, visiting border posts along the Soviet Union border uh, tracking their missile tests. Secretary Schultz's longest trip as Secretary of State, and he said his best, uh, accompanying Chinese leaders at very high levels throughout the United States. Uh, Betty and I visiting 30 provinces. Betty and I hosting weekly working meals and salons for artists, academics, officials, and dissidents together, something that couldn't be done today, I'm sad to say. Uh, and the production of the Kane Mutiny that my wife put on with Charlton Heston as the director, didn't speak a word of Chinese, and Herman Walk, the author who was there and had seen productions all over the world, said that along with opening night on Broadway, this was the most exciting night he'd ever seen for this show. Those are the highlights. The low light should have been the highlight. President Bush came shortly after inauguration, the senior Bush, February 1989. And as part of his schedule, we had to arrange a return banquet, uh, some of you know this story, uh, in which all walks of life were to be invited, uh, and several hundred for a Texas barbecue. We felt he had to make some statement on human rights, not as provocative as Reagan meeting separately with dissidents, but we felt, in addition to going to church, we should invite a few reformers and dissidents to this huge banquet, which we did. One of them was Fang Lejeur. Uh, make a long story short, the Chinese at the last minute protested. We cleared our invitation list with Washington, and State Roy was heroic on this in retrospect, with the State Department and the White House. We twice sent in cable saying that this could cause some trouble with the Chinese, but we thought it was an important statement to make. To make a long story shorter, the Chinese protesters said they wouldn't go to the bank. We worked out a deal where they would go as long as Fang Lejeur didn't uh, make a press conference and, and didn't sit at the head table, which of course was fine. The last minute they blocked his entry to the banquet hall. It ruined the president's trip. It went down the tubes. Three days later, the national security advisor gave a backgrounder in which he said, that the embassy and the ambassador had, in fact, screwed up the president's trip by inviting this dissident, and furthermore, hadn't cleared it with Washington. This was the low light. Uh, <laughs> I, I'll finish by saying I wrote the National Security Advisor a secret cable through the CIA with a copy to the Secretary of State. Said, I'm a big boy. I'm willing to fall on my sword for the national interest, including in this case. But here's why you've made a mistake. First of all, I reviewed the bidding on the clearance and, and so on. Number one, you show weakness to the Chinese just as you enter the White House. But when they act outrageously and renege on an agreement, and you blame your own team. Number two, you discourage Chinese reformers. Number three, you alienate Congress and human rights activists at home. Number four, at least important, but of some interest, you have destroyed my credibility. Uh, <laughs> I'm still waiting for a response from you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it does show, however, in retrospect, the tension that was gripping the Chinese, including Deng Xiaoping personally, because four months later, we had the massacre that we will commemorate uh, the 25th anniversary of in about two weeks. Stabe. 
it's hard to top uh, Ambassador Lord in, in any respect. But if you look at the graph of U.S.-China relations, you will see that his four years in Beijing were basically one long high point, except for that final <laughs> ending, and mine was one long low point. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I've been reflecting on this because it didn't seem just to me at the time that it should be this way, and the only explanation I've been able to come up with is that I was the official in Washington who sent Ambassador Lord his instructions during his long high point, and he was the official in Washington who sent me my instructions during the long low point. <laughs> However, that's not an inadequate explanation. Um, I've got other explanations. <laughs> with respect to his low point, uh, he's absolutely right. He could not have handled the invitation to Fong Li more properly. And when President Bush and Brent Scowcroft got angry at him, for the way that it had been handled, I spoke to both of them and said this was cleared with Washington and I was a State Department official who ensured that it was properly um, uh, cleared in Washington. And it was water off a duck's back. Uh, that made up their mind that the embassy had somehow done it and it was a, a major injustice. My low points were largely self-inflicted. Not entirely, but largely self-inflicted. I began on a low point. Uh, we had an ambassador between us, so I wasn't picking up from Ambassador Lord's uh, low point. But in my first meeting with the Chinese foreign minister, I persuaded him to reverse the Chinese decision not to give a visa to Nancy Pelosi, uh, and so she was admitted to China. She then told me she was going back to the hotel to rest, and instead she took a television crew down to Tiananmen Square and unfurled a human rights ban. <laughs> Now, in my long diplomatic career of over 40 years, I've only seen officials truly angry on two occasions. One was Deng Xiaoping. When we went back in, I accompanied Ambassador Woodcock back in during the normalization negotiations to confirm that we would be continuing arms sales to Taiwan. And he had apparently thought that we were not going to continue them, and he got genuinely angry. The second, was in connection with Nancy Pelosi's uh, behavior in Beijing, where the foreign ministry basically blamed me for having let her in, even though I had told the foreign minister that if they let her in, there might be trouble, but I thought that there would be even more trouble if they didn't let her in. So one of my high points, however, was getting her in again two years later. <laughs> and she behaved impeccably because she came as part of a congressional delegation and the chairman of the delegation uh, of the committee was along and she behaved extremely well. <laughs> then in order to provide a proper base for my successor to look good, I also left China on a low point. <laughs> uh, which had to do with the last minute reversal of our decision not to let the president of Taiwan, Li Donghui, visit the United States and we reversed that decision at the last minute, and uh, for some reason, the Chinese government got very upset about that. Uh, this eased my departure from China because all of my requests for farewell calls were turned down, uh, with the exception of the president and the premier of China. Uh, they were prepared to see me so they could bawl me out. Uh, in between, if things were beginning to look too good, uh, we were able to work in uh, additional low points. Uh, in the fall of 92, I had to go in and tell them we had decided to sell F-16 aircraft uh, to uh, Taiwan. And then uh, Win Lord sent me a very important instruction to go in and tell the Chinese that we had decided to link their most favored nation status to human rights conditions. And uh, I was not given instructions how to avoid being thrown out of the office. <laughs> and that was really a problem, because we would have been left in a very difficult situation uh, if they had refused to accept the Demarche, which they might very well have done, claiming that this was interference in internal affairs. So one of my high points was not getting thrown out of the office <laughs> when I went in to deliver this news to them. Uh, were there additional? Well. 
when Nord behaved admirably in another of my low points, I gave an interview to the New York Times about conditions in China, which appeared on the New York Times in January of 2004, uh, 2094, uh, 1994. And in it, I could describe conditions in China as having vastly improved, but the human rights conditions had not. And in fact, that was in the first paragraph of the interview. But the headline said, U.S. envoy in Beijing says rights improving in China. And needless to say, Capitol Hill and the State Department went bananas over this. And Winston Lord, who read the full text of my interview, uh, was helpful in getting people to focus on the fact that I had actually been defending administration policy, and they had a policy on human rights. We did not have a policy on conditions in China. So I was not saying anything that was contrary to the administration's position, but it was interpreted as my saying that the human rights conditions in China were improving. Were there high points? Yes. But most of them had to do with getting senior officials into China. Uh, we got a visit by Jim Baker in the fall of 1991. Carla, you came as a special trade representative as I recall, and that was a high point. High point. We had Barbara Franklin come in as Commerce Secretary. Uh, later, we got Secretary of Defense uh, Perry uh, in. We got Secretary of uh, Commerce Ron Brown uh, to come in. We got uh, Secretary Espy of Agriculture to come in, and we got Hazel uh, O'Leary, the Secretary of Energy. These were high points. I was never given the opportunity to have state visit exchanges and things of this sort, but another high point was the 1993 uh, summit uh, of APEC that took place in Seattle, and Jiang Zemin went to that meeting and met with President Clinton uh, on that occasion. So these were some of the high points. But basically, I was more effective at producing low points uh, than <laughs> I was in producing high points, and this was very important in enabling my successor to look good. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, you were not the immediate successor. Though. I was not. Jim Sasser ought to be here. He was That's right. Sasser. Jim was the beneficiary. But, <clears throat> but I've learned something today, because I am not a career foreign service guy. I was a Navy guy. I was a pilot. And I've learned one thing today, though, that State Department people don't hold a grudge for long. <laughs> <laughs> The, the other thing that I think we all have in common, though, when you're a, a field hand for the U.S. government or probably any government, one of your great fears is your, your capital will take an unsignaled left turn and you'll be left headed on out in this direction. You'll be sort of hanging out to dry, and that, hangs at, that happens from time to time. Um, one of the things that comes up is it depends on the time in which you were in China, how, whether your high points or low points are, are easy to come by or not. And a little bit of context, uh, I, w I had the Pacific forces at, at PACOM in 1996 when you allowed Li Tung Wei to, <laughs> to come to Cornell. <laughs> and uh, so the, at that time, the Chinese uh, decided to try to influence the, the elections on March 22nd of 1996 to, uh, they thought they'd shoot a few missiles off of Taiwan. Well, at PACOM, my job was to carry out U.S. defense stuff in the Pacific and Indian Ocean area, so we came up with a plan to respond to that, uh, to respond to our responsibilities to Taiwan, to uh, not derail our relationships with China, but to make, them, make sure that uh, the Chinese government knew that was uh, not something that was uh, satisfactory under our obligations with the Taiwan Relations Act. And then the third thing was to send a signal to the American people and the other to our allies in the area. We came up with a de decent plan. Bill Perry was Secretary of State, I mean was Secretary of Defense, and John Challey Cashville was the chairman. And we used the Seventh Fleet, and we were very careful not to go in the Taiwan Straits, but to be in the area to try to transmit this message. This went pretty well. One of the things, uh, this is all by way of context, I realized we did not have any uh, particular communications with the PLA. So I spent the rest of my time in Hawaii, one 
major goal was to try to create some relationship with the PLA. Well, that was March of 1996. Then in the fall of 96 was my first trip to China, again, not as ambassador, but as a military guy, uh, representing the Clinton administration because that was right before an election. They didn't want anybody that might have to get votes to go to China. So I, I got tagged to do that, and I got the uh, duty numbers of lectures and uh, met with the leadership of China a good bit, and, and it was generally a good trip, but I got chewed on a, uh, a lot by my friend uh, Shengguang Kai and, and others. Uh, then uh, in 97, Zhang Jimin made his first state trip to, to Washington, D.C., and he came through Hawaii, and uh, he, I was his host along with uh, Ben Cayetano, the governor, and that was the first of many times that Zhang Jimin thumped me in the chest with his finger and uh, asked, what are you trying to do with the PLA? And uh, I told him we were trying to build some trust so we did not miscalculate. He, he then made a statement that I've always remembered that's a, a good one for the U.S.-China relationship. He said, before you can have trust, you must have communications. And once you have communications, you must have understanding. And then you can maybe build some trust. But there's a hierarchy of things, which is comms, understanding, and then trust. Good thing to keep in mind as we work on the relationship going forward as well. Well, with, with those things in mind, then uh, uh, for whatever reason, the Clinton, Bill Clinton uh, nominated me to go to China uh, and to be, follow Jim Sasser. In 1999 also, uh, U.S. aircraft bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. This created uh, some havoc which you would expect. I mean, if, uh, I like to think if the Chinese had bombed one of our embassies somewhere, whether it's by mistake or there, there, there would not be any good reason that, that they would ever, that we would believe, and they don't believe there's any good reason that we did that either, though I, I'm pretty doggone sure it was, it was, a, it was an error, but it was an egregious error anyway. So that created some some challenges for Jim Sasser, who's not here with us tonight, but uh, he, he and Mary Sasser left, and so we left, there was a void there, and then my wife Suzanne and I came in 1999, late 1999, and uh, we, had, we had quite a few high points. I'm, I'm sort of a simple guy, I like it everywhere. I had a great time in China. I like dealing with the Chinese. My favorite phrase was, um, you know, what's, what's tough, Mr. Ambassador? And I would always say, getting along with your government. And that, that created a bad reaction from the Chinese. And then I followed that up and I said, the second hardest thing I have to do is get along with my government. <laughs> and that, that kind of eased things a bit. But the, some of the, I, I would like to mention just a, a couple or three high points and then, then talk about a low point, which is more serious again. The Chinese had a general named Zhang Wenyan. He was the uh, chairman of the Central Military Committee, or vice chairman of the Central Military Committee. He was a salty old guy. He fought in Korea. Uh, he, he was the kind of person that, for, for my likes, I liked him right away. I mean, he was a warrior. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't a city slicker type of guy. He reminded me of Jim Mattis, if any of you know our, our Marine General Jim Mattis, who's retired. Great guy, he spoke his mind. But anyway, Gen General Zhang and I were facing a bunch of uh, uh, Chinese and media people and a lot of people from the PLA, and I was starting to take some heat. And uncharacteristically, uh, General Zhang came up and he put his, put his arm on me and he said, in, in, Chi in Mandarin, he said, Admiral Preer and I are after the same thing. We are after good relations between our nations, and what we are trying to do is get our military people to talk when they are very young, so that when they get to be our age, they will have a relationship and they'll have a friendship on which to build. That was quite a high point for me, because that was an uncharacteristic move, and it very accurately described what, what we were trying to achieve. Another one that's even a little more lighthearted than that, my wife, Suzanne, we, we 
came to China sort of abruptly and did not uh, get a chance to learn much Chinese, though we struggled with it a little bit. Well, she'd been working hard and trying to get a sentence that she could say. And so after we'd been there a year or so, we went to a, it was sort of a combination ballet and gymnastics type event that was beautiful. And we sat with President Jiang Zemin. And so as we were walking out, Suzanne took that opportunity to make her first foray into using her new Chinese with the president of China. And uh, <laughs> his, his response was, it's, I'm, I'm so happy you're trying to learn Chinese. <laughs> and uh, and uh, to, this, to this day, she has always said, I can't believe that I did that the first time, my first round of trying to use Chinese on the president of China. And he, he did it very good naturedly. The, uh, some of the other great times were out of Beijing, uh, out in Yunnan province, uh, working with Yunnan province and uh, seeing the uh, Tiger Leaping Gorge the, uh, and, and going to the area out there where the, the rivers are, and just the gorgeous countryside, which is something that most Americans don't think about when they go to China and seeing that that rough country is out there, it's much like the Grand Tetons or Jackson Hole, that part of the United States, it's just gorgeous. We had some wonderful times out there, some cookouts and spent time with some of the minorities. And then, uh, let me, I can see Steve has been looking at his watch the whole time. <laughs> but, uh, not at all, not at all, but, just trying to. But now he's trying, starting to tap it and shake it and stuff <laughs> like that, so I'll wind up pretty quickly here. It's a good admiral. But uh, the, I guess the, the low point, and it, it really wasn't a low point, it was just doing, you know, just doing work, but we, the, fairly soon before we left, it was April Fool's Day of 2001, there was a collision between an American EP-3 and a Chinese fighter. And uh, I'm not going to go into that event a lot because it would be a uh, it's protracted, it's sort of a separate discussion. But uh, I, one, my counterpart was uh, Zhou Wenzhong. He was the other negotiator for this. Uh, we became good friends through this negotiation. Uh, I think we, we sort of solved the problem and moved, it, moved ahead pretty well. But like you, when the time came for me to leave, I didn't have to schedule a lot of uh, parties <laughs> and stuff like that. And the, uh, one of the things that had come up in trying to solve this was after we had had, after this collision occurred, I tried to call the foreign ministry for about nine hours. And of course, they had caller ID, so they didn't answer. And um, I got a lot of heat for this because your friends, the Chinese, won't, won't answer your calls. And uh, anyway, as we, as we left, uh, Chen Chi Chen, who was then the state counselor, hosted Suzanne and me for a lunch. That was our farewell party. And he said, you know, we really would have returned those phone calls except it was Arbor Day and we were all off planting trees that day. So that was, the, <laughs> that, that was sort of a lighthearted time, but it was a little bit of a low. Hmm. It was a good time in China. John, you're used to this format after the Republican debates. Well, don't, don't remind, don't <laughs> remind me of those days, please. <laughs> it's a lot. I won't say it. <laughs> you know, I mean, we could take that in a thousand directions, Steve, but I'll spare you all, I'll spare you all the, the details. Uh, and it's only appropriate that I, I'm getting the handoff from, from Joe because my, my son will get his diploma in two days at the U.S. Naval Academy from Admiral Prayer. So this is symmetric here. Oh. This is symmetric. And Joe, you'll be giving your son? Your son is also graduating now. No, my son's 40. Oh, your son's 40. <laughs> he's graduating. <laughs> You're he's handing out the slow, degree. He's pretty slow, but he's, he's got <laughs> what, what, what this does more than anything, Steve, is it brings back a flood of memories about every emotion you feel in this job. The high point is arriving for me. The low point was leaving because it's the best job in the world. And I see it not from, you know, you've, you've heard some snippets of very important history in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. 
security, military, economic, human rights, it's, it's all there, it all makes it up. But there's a human dimension that struck me over and over again as being totally extraordinary. And so I went from the governor's mansion, uh, which was a great job, and Gary knows this, being governor is, is a great place to be. Open, transparent, circus-like, which is a, a politics in America, to the most compartmented, uh, closed off job, probably one of them in the US government, where the language you use literally and figuratively is foreign. The issues you work on are completely different from those of domestic uh, American politics. But a high point for me was interacting with the men and women who now work in the embassy. Because I could compare and contrast, I know Stape and, and Wynn are able to do this as well given their long history. From my first trip to China, with Reagan when I was a young advanced man in the early 1980s when the embassy was small. And now it's very large. And the caliber of people that we're getting today that you're able to rub shoulders with and design and tailor policy with uh, and strategizing with on how best to position the United States is truly remarkable. That's number one. Number two is you can't walk into the ambassador's residence without feeling a sense of history about the importance of the US-China relationship. I didn't walk through that red door once without thinking about Wynn or State or Joe. And when I saw George Bush uh, a little bit later, we discovered that our dogs peed on the same tree. In the <laughs> and, and it has an, an element of humanizing this job for the people who are lucky enough to have it. It's really quite an extraordinary feeling that I've never felt in any other job that I've had three. You find as a high point that the issues you work on really mean something to people. So the United States, as I called Wynn before I went out, as I did everybody, he said to me, as the newly appointed guy, remember the United States has values. They're important to people. Then I took that on board. And indeed, I visited on one occasion, which brought it all home to me, uh, a, uh, a woman in trouble by the name of Miu Lan, who was a dissident and trapped in her apartment, no heat, no electricity, no nothing. Uh, and she had some grievances that she was very outspoken about. And I walked into her little apartment as the US ambassador, you know, just a plain old public servant. And it brought tears to her eyes, and, and then it did to mine, because I could sense the power of not Huntsman arriving to see Miss Nee, but the United States arriving. And everything that I represented in that job the values inherent in lifting those who are fighting for more freedom and access and transparency. That, to me, represented everything good about the job, is that you're standing for something that really does mean something to a lot of people. Uh, the low point, I was gonna say, you know, there, we can all talk about chapters of history. This probably is low and high, but riding my bike to the foreign ministry one day, because I, I could always get there on bike faster than in the car. <laughs> and, you always pull up at the gate there and the, and the, and the, and the, and the PLA guard, the Wujing looks at you like, oh, here's a crazy American again. Should we let him in or not? <laughs> and on one occasion, I pulled the bike up and there was a North Korean ambassador's car. This is right after the sinking of the Chonan, uh, which was a very tense time in the relationship. And I parked my bike right in front of the Korean ambassador's car, thereby blocking him in. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> 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 and I, I saw that as a, as a score. <laughs> but uh, on, on the, the, the low points of, of serving in Beijing, I have to say that presidential visits are no longer a positive, uplifting affair. They're always fraught with risk and difficulty. The expectations are always set by the media, which are impossible to hit. So I was not of the party of my president. Uh, but I was serving the United States and I knew that President Obama was trying to do what he thought was best and right for the United States. And in planning all the preparation for a state visit, and we had one, in, one to China and then of course Hu Jintao went to Washington, it was, it was fraught with kind of a takeover of what politics and media communication have become, uh, the point scoring, uh, the, uh, the, the who's up, who's down, who wins, who loses, as opposed to the longer term strategic construct in which we need to maintain this most important relationship. But finally, I'll just say this as maybe not too happy a, a way in which to leave my comments. And that is uh, 
probably one of the most despairing aspects of the job is to realize that we're not too terribly prepared in our country, in Washington, to deal with this relationship longer term. So trying to find someone in Congress who understands the relationship, who cares about the relationship, who wants to invest some political capital in the relationship is getting increasingly difficult. And finding government bandwidth where we can actually develop and maintain and manage a strategy between the US and China, which we absolutely desperately need, is becoming almost impossible. And that is probably the most frustrating aspect of the job right now, is trying to navigate it in a direction that speaks to the long-term outcomes that would be good for both China and the United States in a highly partisan, divided political environment. Well said. Well, let me, let me just say that uh, I think I have been able to benefit, and I know that uh, Governor Huntsman, Ambassador Huntsman, have, all of us have benefited from the work of our predecessors. Um, and, and uh, you know, have really, all of you, especially in the early days of the relationship, uh, in the early 35 years of diplomatic relations, have really set the stage uh, for so much of the work that we uh, have been able to do as, as your successors. So I, I very much want to thank you for the incredible foresight, the development of policy, the relationships that you've uh, formed. Uh, in moving the relationship forward. I, I, you know, I, there's so many things that have been already been said. Uh, I don't want to repeat it, and so I want to touch on a couple of different things. But obviously, incredible staff, the incredible, excellent, dedicated personnel of the State Department at our embassy, where we have almost 1,000 people just in the U.S. Embassy alone, uh, about one-third of American and two-thirds Chinese, but that American staff, just incredibly dedicated, and we were able to, during the time that I was there, to really try to bring them closer together to work more holistically, break down some of the silos that, as, as uh, John indicated, can be so frustrating. I mean, uh, boy, the lingo, the terminology, the bureaucracy of the State Department is mind-numbling. And then when you also have some 40 other agencies represented and how they don't talk to each other, even though they might be all law enforcement, trying to get them on the same page, working with each other and helping each other, that was a constant challenge. But we were able to move the, the, the needle forward, working together on economic issues, advancing uh, U.S. exports of American-made goods and services, creating jobs in America, promoting more Chinese investment to uh, America, helping the Chinese create factories here, again, employing people and, and improving the U.S. economy. Um, I, I guess I'd say some of the stressful points, I wouldn't say low points, but some of the stressful points when I was there. Uh, obviously, when Wang Lijun walked into our consulate in Chengdu, basically asking for asylum, you, you can't do it. I mean, you know, if you, if you want to defect, if you want to seek asylum, you do it outside of your country that you're trying to leave. You know, like, like if you're a Russian general and you want to defect to the United States, you've got to somehow get outside of Russia, you know, go to Paris or go to France, or, I mean, England or something. If you're an athlete, you're competing in some other country, and then you go into someone else's embassy and say, hey, uh, I, I want to stay, uh, protect me. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you're a Russian general, if you're trying to defect in Moscow, I mean, you know, once you, the United States tries to take that general outside the, the gates of the embassy, the, the Russians can see them. You know, if, if we get them to the airport, the Russians can stop the airplane from taking off. So um, this was a, a very stressful situation, uh, almost 48 hours of, of uh, tense communication with Washington, D.C., uh, with a consulate, uh, communications with the British Embassy and, and many other governments uh, uh, involved. And what's, what's so stressful about it is that ultimately uh, he left on his own accord, but we had to make sure that he was comfortable leaving. Uh, we enabled him to negotiate uh, with the authorities in Beijing for his safe uh, um, uh, departure and, uh, and being escorted in a safe fashion to Beijing. And of course, we all know that that then led to the expose about uh, Bo Xilai and all of that, which then created such a huge political, uh, huge political turmoil and repercussions throughout all of China, uh, leading up to the, uh, uh, to the leadership change of China. Another stressful point, obviously, was when uh, uh, Chen Guangchun uh, came into our, our embassy and uh, we had to coordinate that, especially with uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton and other U.S. cabinet officials coming within the next few days for the strategic and economic dialogue. We did not want that to be uh, 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 
uh, disrupted, but at the same time we had to protect American values, what, what others have talked about, that we had to stand for American values. And at one point when the negotiations were not going well, uh, and Mr. Chung Wan Chun had complete uh, approval of any of the terms we were negotiating on his behalf, and when it did not appear that the Chinese government would uh, accept his terms for leaving the embassy. And he never wanted to come to the United States. He only wanted to be able to move freely within China and to leave his village and to get an education for himself and his family and to live under better conditions. When it did not appear that we would be able to achieve what he wanted, we were prepared to have him be a permanent resident or a long-term resident in the U.S. Embassy. Uh, and knowing that that could affect uh, the U.S.-China relationship for years to come. But we were upholding our values as a country. Uh, let me just say that uh, the, the great highlights, uh, for me, are perhaps more personal. Um, being the first Chinese-American uh, to uh, be the U.S. ambassador to China it was a great symbol to the Chinese people. And it was, to them, it was a source of pride, but also, I think, a uh, um, uh, demonstration, a recognition of what America stands for. So that a person of a different ethnic background from the majority uh, of, of America could achieve a very high position and come back uh, to ancestral country and represent that other government. That in America, all things are possible just as we were able to tell the American people that I'm not that unusual. We have so many people of color, Asian Americans, African Americans, Hispanics in high positions of government. We have an African American president. Chinese Americans and Asian Americans hold the highest positions in academia, in business, in finance, in government. And that's what America is all about, a land of freedom, hope, and opportunity. Uh, and the other high point really was something actually started by John Huntsman, which was the air quality monitoring program. It was started just be, uh, under his term. And, but when, when I arrived, the Chinese government wanted us to shut it down because it was just being uh, 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 implemented. And we resisted that. In fact, we expanded the program to all of our consulates throughout China. Uh, and, of course, we were trying to pr improve the system so that it was reliable, so that the data was constantly being disseminated, uh, because we did have some problems early on of, of the uh, system shutting down and we could not get the information out. Um, but so many people of China then started receiving our information by going to our website. They then retweeted it uh, using Weibo all across the community. And it really forced the Chinese government to acknowledge it. And, and one of the highlights really has to be uh, my travels throughout China, where Chinese people who speak very little English would come up to me and say, xie xie, PM 2.5. <laughs> I mean, the Chinese understand PM 2.5 more than Americans do. All right? What is PM 2.5? Most people here in the audience would not have a clue what PM 2.5. It's particulate matter smaller than 2.5 microns, which is the really nasty, dirty stuff that can affect your health and gets into your bloodstream and has very, very bad health effects. The Chinese are aware of it. And thanks to the, the program started by the U.S. Embassy uh, and spread throughout the consulates, the Chinese people are aware of it, agitating and pushing for more environmental protection, especially air quality. The Chinese government can no longer deny it. They cannot just say it's fog, and they un feel the pressure to do something about it as well. Uh, and finally, just being so warmly received, our entire family, uh, everywhere we went, we were so warmly received by the Chinese people. And uh, the highlight has to be uh, taking our children to so many parts of China so they could really understand the diversity uh, and the, the cultural history and the beauty of China and exploring the China of their ancestors. Gary mentioned speeding up visa processing. Oh. <laughs> Well, uh, that's a big, big deal. Um, actually, I had been focusing on the, how long it, it took for the Chinese to get a visa all the way back from my days as governor, when uh, Washington State companies would invite Chinese business people to come to Washington State to maybe buy or look at their products. 
uh, and suddenly they could not get a visa. And when I was Commerce Secretary, I heard the same complaints, that so many Chinese who wanted to come to the United States to look at an American product, it took so long, and this had been going on for years, that you know, if it takes 70 to 100 days to get a visa, that Chinese business person can say, forget it, I'll go to Canada, I'll go to Germany, I'll go to France, I can buy that product, I can get a visa much faster, I can buy that product in another country, or if I'm a tourist, if it takes that long to get a visa interview with no guarantee of getting a visa, well, we'll go vacation in Australia, we'll vacation in Europe. So I really felt that this was costing us American jobs. American jobs. And I actually saved an article from Newsweek back in around 2003 or 2002. I still have it filed away, and I came across it the other day. It was a letter written by then Harvard President Larry Summers to then Secretary of State Colin Powell saying that this, the cumbersome visa policies throughout the world, not just applying for the Chinese to come to the United States, was hurting America, depriving opportunities for graduate students to come to the best colleges and universities who can then do R&D and create new products and innovations that would benefit the U.S. economy, but more importantly, denying foreigners, and especially the Chinese, the opportunity to see America firsthand, to see our democracy in action, and that these are the future leaders of China and other countries, and by giving them, making it easier for them to get a visa to come to the United States is actually importing or transferring our values to them so that when they go back to their native country, they can be agents of democracy, change, diversity, and all that America stands for. So we really made an effort uh, to uh, speed up the visa processes. And typical State Department people said, can't be done. Can't be done unless we have a lot more people, unless we have uh, more money for overtime, or unless we build new buildings and more you know, processing windows. And then when they do say yes, Homeland Security says no. <laughs> <laughs> just all this bureaucracy. And I said, yes, we can fix it. We're just going to blow it all up, and we're going to start all over, the, start the process over again. Within a month and a half, instead of 70 to 100-day wait times to get a visa interview, we dropped it down to five. And within the last two and a half years, it stayed three to five days, even as the demand has gone up by 70%. I really think that that has really enabled so many more Chinese to come to America to shop, uh, to be tourists, uh, to buy American goods and services, and that's not only creating jobs for the American people, but really increasing that cultural people-to-people -people understanding and helping uh, uh, export uh, American values, democracy, uh, uh, to the Chinese people. This was driven by the ambassador. Mm -hmm. I, deeply appreciated by many Chinese, I know. Let me ask a question. We'll, let's keep our answers to one minute in this case. Um, four months ago, uh, Senator Baucus was nominated as, as uh, ambassador, and he arrived there in March. Based on your experiences, I hope he consulted with you before, uh, with the five. Well, he saw I, with the five of you before he left. But what 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 advice would you offer in a nutshell to him? Um, as he starts on this Well, let me pick off a few things. Uh, for, there's a couple that I would advise him, which would be true of almost any embassy post. Number one, convey the other country, in this case China's, strong views, but don't suffer from clientitis. So don't write in a cable saying, don't sell arms to Taiwan, or don't meet the Dalai Lama because you hurt the Chinese feelings. That's not the job of the American ambassador to make himself popular with the host country, but it is his job to convey their strong views. Secondly, again, this would be true around the world, get out in the country, see as many types of people, many places as possible, and not only officials, of course, but those who have some trouble with the government as well as many other walks of life. Two China-specific things, uh, red lines are important. Try to understand what each country's red lines are if you're in tough negotiations with the Chinese and they're willing to be accommodating, find out a way to give them face. If they're being tough, find an exit strategy so they can come forward. The last point I would make, remember in China at all times, wherever you are, you're being listened to. So if you don't want sea slugs at a banquet, just say so in your living room and <laughs> you'll be happy that evening. Stape. I had a good long conversation with uh, uh, Ambassador Baucus before he left, and I found that he was really dedicated to the job and 
eager to do the best possible um, performance as an American ambassador. Uh, I, was, I was very encouraged by his attitude, but not surprised, because he's had a long-standing interest in US-China relations. Um, our conversation moved into the special aspect of the US ambassador in China. Because to a degree that is greater than that of any other Asian country, China's relations with all of the countries of the region are very important in terms of US foreign policy. And therefore, I encouraged him to not simply focus on US-China relations, but he had to understand, because no other ambassador in Asia, American ambassador in Asia, can provide that overview of how trends in the region are moving. But our embassy and our ambassador, because of the importance of all these relationships, has the ability <coughs> to look at that. And there are not many officials in Washington who actually are able to look at the region as a whole. Uh, if I were ambassador in Singapore and presumed to do so, I mean, it would be laughable. But if you're ambassador in Beijing, because of the importance of the Chinese relationship throughout the region, uh, it really makes a difference. Uh -huh. And he was very receptive to uh, uh, looking at the region from the large picture standpoint. Joe? The, uh, <clears throat> the only conversation is uh, we had as an ambassador's authority come from about a page and a half or two page letter signed by the president. And so the ambassador has an immense amount of authority to deal with U.S. men, women, equipment, and, and agencies within a nation. And I encourage them to use that authority boldly as opposed to not. You have a lot of authority if you know how to use it. John. Uh, so uh, we had uh, several conversations, and I'll, I'll just tell you specifically what, what I told them. I, first of all, I, you know, to set the stage here, I read the article today about, about uh, Max being called into the foreign ministry right. and mm -hmm. dressed down by assistant foreign minister Zhang Ziguang, uh, which of course wasn't the vice foreign minister, it was the assistant foreign minister. So I was replaying how many times that had happened to me on different issues. And I can just guess now that he will be locked out of meetings for some time as this I issue plays out and his travel in the region will likely be restricted. But, but I told him, you just got, you've got a couple of things going for you. You've got an enormously capable country team, the finest in the United States government. Your job then is to set the priorities and keep everybody on the same page. And you'll be remembered by not 100 things, because nobody can do 100 things, but maybe two or three things. So here's what I would do as a fellow West Westerner. I'd open the beef market, because you understand the beef market, <laughs> and you understand that a billion dollars in trade overnight, and as Gary knows, the beef market is probably this close to getting, getting open. Yep. That'd be a huge deal for our exporters. Number two, finish the bilateral investment treaty, because that will govern trade and investment for years to come, and it will really up the level of economic engagement that is desperately needed and keep us focused on something that is positive in the relationship. And third, do what you do best, because each of us brought a certain background to the job, and you can name one or two things that each of us brought that was unique to our set of skills or our professional history, and in Max's case, he knows Capitol Hill better than anybody. He's been chair of the Finance Committee. He, more than anyone else, can open doors for members of Congress to reintroduce them to China and to bring people from China and reintroduce them to leaders on Capitol Hill. If done and done right, that could yield significant dividends of the bilateral re relationship. I have a question, by the way. My, my next question was, what is that dressing down? When you get that dressing down, what, what, what is it? Give me a sense of what it's like when, the, when MFA has to read you these talking points saying, you know, you have behaved inappropriately. The United States government has behaved inappropriately. But Gary, you first answer, then I'll ask. I, I think uh, all of us have covered the same points, uh, travel the countryside, um, uh, use the incredible staff of the embassy, the dedicated professionals. One thing I did emphasize to him, and I talked with him a lot on the phone while I was still in Beijing, and then I met with him after I came back to the United States, and, and he was about to leave in about a, a week uh, for Beijing. Uh, one thing I reminded him was that um, he's responsible not just for the personnel in the embassy, but their entire families. It's like a military commander on a base. You're responsible for the welfare of everyone on the base, including their families. 
uh, and you really have to look out after them, whether it's uh, domestic violence, substance abuse, uh, kids that are acting out, their education, the quality of the schools, uh, and that um, you know, a really well-functioning embassy depends on the entire community in addition to all of these things that we talked about. The dressing down. Just I can g give you an example. You guys are fooling around with assistant ministers. I got dressed down by Deng Xiaoping personally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was the spring of 1988, a year before Tiananmen Square. There was a, a floating salon on the lawns of Beijing University. Democracy salons became to be known. I didn't realize at the time, none of us did, how pregnant this was about the future, but it was run by future leaders of the Tiananmen Square demonstrations. They invited a whole series of speakers out to speak to the students. Oh, Betty and I went out there. I remember this. Betty and I went out there. Right? We spent several hours. I was very careful because I knew there'd be government people in the audience. I didn't want to get the students in trouble. Uh, they went a lot about you know, biracial marriage. Betty's from Shanghai and so on. They went a lot about <laughs> non-sensitive topics, but they got in a very sensitive topic. You could see their passion. I was very careful, and in fact, I praised Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms. And in fact, the Hong Kong newspaper ran a headline says, Ambassador praises Deng Xiaoping. He didn't see it that way. <laughs> About three days later, I'm at a banquet, and the then ambassador from China to the US, Han Xu, came up to me with a personal message from Deng Xiaoping. It was politely worded, but it basically said, how dare you go out and speak to students? Uh, check with me first. <laughs> I went back, again, very respectful, but basically said, I'm going to continue to do what I'm doing. That's part of my job. We wouldn't tell your ambassador not to go to Harvard a year. Well, I'd tell him not to go to Harvard, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so anyway, the, the le the le that's an example. The lesson is, it is frustrating. For several weeks, universities who I was going to speak to, somehow the, the schedule got busy, I couldn't do it. Think tanks would cancel meetings. So you gotta, you gotta navigate. You gotta be firm, you can't get angry, you gotta keep your cool, and you can't get defensive. And immediately this too shall pass, and that's what happened, but it was a tough few weeks. <coughs> I'll just add a brief comment on it, because I, I mentioned this to Ambassador Bacchus. Um, I've learned the hard way that particularly when you're in a nasty meeting where the other side is beating up on you, uh, you are writing the cable in your mind before you leave the meeting. And making sure you're going to look good, right? And no, sure no, it's not a question of looking good. <laughs> it's making sure that you say what Washington will want you to say before you leave the meeting. The worst thing that can happen to you is to go to a meeting and send in a reporting cable and have Washington come back and say, go in and make these points. Uh, and if you're in tune, and I was very fortunate having somebody like Wynne Lord uh, back there, you know what those points are going to be, and you're sure to say those at the time so that your reporting cable doesn't require follow-up action, uh, except on a substantive level rather than leaving out something you should have said. Uh, for example, if you get dressed down on a human rights question, you have to say uh, that we don't agree with your position. Uh, it's other people's turn, but I would just on this very yeah. subject, when the Chinese created the Fang Lejeur incident, said they weren't going to the banquet, and they insisted that uh, we withdraw the invitation. This is before the president arrived. In the same meeting, I said, I will, of course, report your views to Washington. Yes. And I stuck my neck out and I said, but I can tell you that they're not going to withdraw the invitation. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> make your point. Yeah. Yeah. I could cite several examples along the same lines, but the, the point is valid. Mm -hmm. I interpreted your question to be more, what is, like, what is the dressing down like? Yeah. And I would say that depends on who administers yeah. it to you. And I, Do they sit there and say, well, I know I have to dress you down, but you're my friend, so this is my talking point. I have, that. I, that, that can happen sometimes. Right. I've had that kind of dressing down. In fact, that's what my wife does. But they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, it's a good dressing down. But, but the, the other, don't tell her, Tom, okay. But uh, the other, I've had ones where I had to have out my handkerchief to keep spittle you know, off my face. And, and from a person who is very high 
in the uh, foreign ministry these days, uh, who was an absolute pro at dressing down. He could, <laughs> he could really go after it, and just, it was a rant. Anything on those? Well, I, yeah, I, I didn't get the Deng Xiaoping dressing down, but I did get uh, a very senior dressing down from someone, let's just say at the Politburo level or so, uh, who ran public security. Uh, had a couple of speeches. <laughs> <laughs> had a couple of speeches I had made, and I was in there with the director of the FBI. We were making courtesy calls to try to figure out how best we could coordinate on, on anti-terror uh, cooperation. And the meeting turned to the ambassador, and it was pretty consistent. And it kind of started with, you've offended 1.3 billion Chinese people. Uh, and it kind of went down from there. And all, all I remember thinking was, well, I'm pretty sure I haven't offended my Chinese daughter at home, Gracie May. She still <laughs> loves me. But, I'll, and I'll just end with this, because the foreign ministry dressing down, sometimes the severity or what you can expect has everything to do with the time of day that you're requested to visit the foreign ministry. So if it's past midnight and like the early hours in the morning, which maybe some of you have experienced, then you know it's pretty bad. And <laughs> so when, when we sold arms to Taiwan, I got the one or two in the morning call, uh, and then you know it's pretty bad. Did you bike over? Uh, <laughs> tra <laughs> traffic, traffic wasn't so bad at that, <laughs> that, <clears throat> that hour. And that's when the and that's when the points come up and the reading begins. And uh, you're pretty sure that you have, in fact, uh, offended 1.3 billion Chinese people. Hmm. Gary, anything on that? Well, uh, I've been called in several times in the wee hours of the morning. And, uh, you know, the staff sometimes says, uh, would, should they take it? I said, no, you know, I'm paid the big bucks. We'll, we'll do it. We'll take it. And uh, we'll take it on the chin. And uh, you sit there. You know, they, they have their talking points, notes. They're reading it being very forceful, they read it. And then, uh, as, as Stape said, you have to respond. Uh, it's, what they're doing is presenting their government view, uh, the Chinese government view to the US government, so we receive it. We will file a cable and send the cable back to Washington, D.C., reporting on what the Chinese government uh, is officially uh, displeased about. But we also make sure that we respond with our uh, talking points about why, whether it's human rights, or whether it's um, uh, you know, issues on North Korea or Taiwan or something or Dalai Lama, that these are the points of, um, of the American government. We respectfully accept your views, but this is our position uh, so that it's very clear that uh, we have our own set of views. Okay. It's then, important to judge the severity of the Gamash. It's not just the time of day or even just the level of the person doing it and try to beat Deng Xiaoping. Uh, but uh, it's also, you read the adjectives, and all of us know how to do this. So there's okay. certain adjectives get you to a decibel <laughs> level of six, some get you up to nine or 10. I mean, you've all brought extraordinary qualifications to the ambassadorships and I think have, have made extraordinary contribution. Two of you speak fluent Chinese. Two of you don't, and one of you speaks some Chinese. Is that, I mean, if I look at the Chinese foreign policy establishment that deals with America, Yang Jiechi, Cui Tiankai, Zhang Yesui, they've all spent a lot of time in the United States, and they all speak excellent English. Does that matter? Is it just, is it just an irrelevance? Should this be a criteria when the president selects an ambassador? You know, from now on, it should be, yes. Uh, look, <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot for bringing this up. We, uh, you know, those of us here who don't speak really appreciate it. <laughs> the, quick, the quick answer is yes. It's very important, and I think it should be a question, seriously. But very quick explanation why I didn't speak Chinese. When I married my wife, I was a foreign service officer. You had to get security clearance. All her relatives were on the mainland. Her father worked indirectly for Taiwan. I was told I could marry her, but I would never work on Chinese affairs. And so I had no incentive to learn the language. And then I got on the plane with Kissinger and went over there, but I couldn't speak. But it's a major asset. It should be done. I agree. Well, I did most of my business as ambassador in Chinese, and that may explain why we had a perpetual low point. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a high, high points when I were there, right? <laughs> I didn't speak. <laughs> Can I expand that question? Some of, there, there is a, you know, not only does the state counselor speak Chinese and, you know, most of the senior levels of the foreign ministry, 
but you have a lot of people in the Chinese government who have now been schooled in the United States, who have gone back and worked, and they, they understand America. If I'm not mistaken, we don't have anyone above the deputy assistant secretary level that has spent time in China or who speaks Chinese. Do you think that has an effect on policy decisions that the United States is making? Does this affect kind of the way we're considering policy? That the Chinese have a lot of folks who've spent a ton of time in the United States making or advising the leadership on these decisions, and we really don't. Let me, let me comment briefly on that. Um, I believe that you, you get an added edge if you're able to speak the language of the country where you're serving. And when I've served in countries where I spoke the language fluently, uh, and that includes both China and Russia, and places where I did not speak the local language fluently, I've always felt inhibited. But I know people who speak Chinese fluently who are absolutely terrible in analyzing China. And I know people who don't speak the language at all who are superb. So I don't consider knowledge of the language the decisive factor in terms of the quality of the representation. But if you had your druthers, you'd want somebody who could deal easily in the language, because especially when you leave the capital cities, you encounter a lower level of, uh, of English knowledge and a lower level of interpretation. And so I, 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 it's a desirable but not necessary factor. I think it's uh, more important. Obviously, it would be a benefit. Uh, I think the more important thing is understanding the culture, the history, the mindset of the Chinese to understand, be able to be in their shoes and understand how they view the world and therefore the United States and the relationship so that we can uh, devise an appropriate response or strategy. Um, and of course, we have at the embassy incredible interpreters. I mean, Jim Brown, who's uh, we all had Jim. He was yeah, crazy. yeah, he's been every he's he's been the interpreter for every U.S. president, starting with uh, President uh, Carter, uh, and uh, is called upon to travel the world with uh, uh, if uh, any of our senior American officials will be meeting with senior Chinese people, whether it's in Singapore or Europe. Jim Brown will go, and he's posted in Beijing. For me, actually, I thought it was a benefit that I did not speak Mandarin. Because the expectations of the Chinese people were that because I'm Chinese American, that I would actually take the side of the Chinese in, in interactions uh, as ambassador and, and in uh, communications back with Washington, D.C. And I think that the fact that, you know, for, uh, for John, he, spoke, he's, he speaks fluent uh, Mandarin, uh, but because he's Caucasian, everybody expects him to represent America, all right? And the U.S. <laughs> government, when they see me, they expect me to represent China or be more sympathetic to the Chinese view. And once they understand that, you know, I don't, I don't speak any Mandarin and maybe a few words of Cantonese, they say, oh, okay, he's, he's representing the U.S. government. So that was, I think, a reminder. And so, uh, but I think, again, it's, it's more important that we have more people in the State Department uh, and in the White House and setting in policy, whether it's in the Congress or elsewhere, understanding the culture, the history, the viewpoints of China. Let me add one to that. One of my throwaway lines talking is more, uh, more Chinese speak English than do Americans. You know, some 300 million Chinese speak, uh, speak English quite well. And so, and almost that many Americans speak it. And uh, <laughs> quite well. <laughs> and, uh, but I think in the, the a point earlier about communications, I, I think netted out having the ability to communicate in the language of a country in which you serve is a, is a net plus. I mean, they're all, there are a bunch of ways to look at it, but I, th I think it's got to be a net plus. And John? I just have to say that my, my daughter would disagree with Gary because she thinks, my Chinese daughter, she thinks her dad is more Chinese than she is. <laughs> and I, will, I will tell so, you. So does my daughter who's sitting there who's Chinese also, she thinks the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I will say as, as we go forward, I think that we are at a disadvantage uh, when it comes not just to language, but the, the prism through which we view culture, which is enhanced by the understanding of language. 
So I would argue that Americans are disadvantaged at the negotiating table when dealing with China. I've watched their level of expertise within the bureaucracy improve over generations to one where there was no English at all, no level of sophistication, no real understanding of the U.S. system to one today where there's impeccable English. I went out to college campuses regularly in China and these kids spoke flawless English. And I try to find counterparts here in the United States where we've got kids coming up speaking Chinese who can match them. And I, I worry about that, that uh, on the human capacity side. Uh, and, I, and I do think for us to be at our best as a country, at the negotiating table, and to be able to develop a longer term strategy, I think language will be an important part in the whole communication side of uh, how we deal in the bilateral uh, relationship. Because China has come light years in terms of their ability to learn English, use it professionally, and read the United States far better than we read China. And I think that puts us at a disadvantage. I think that's really true of, of all of our diplomacy and, and the fact that all of us, in, or most of us in America, don't speak foreign languages. And for us to really be effective in foreign policy, in, in this especially global, high-tech economy, more people of America at all levels, from government to business, academia, finance, culture, you name it, need to be speaking more languages. You go to Italy, you go to the hotel there, and the clerk there speaks three or four languages. And we in our, in our hotels can barely speak English at all. You know, I mean, uh, so I mean, I, we really need to focus on that, which is why more cultural exchange, having more Americans studying in China and learning the language is so important. We have some 200, over 200,000 Chinese studying in American colleges and universities, and at most we have maybe 20,000 Americans studying yeah. in China. Uh, that is not a recipe for uh, you know, successful uh, cooperation. Well, one of the reasons we have a sold out room is I promised the um, audience the opportunity to ask some questions. So if you would put up your hands, and I will, um, I will recognize, let's start with Professor Cohen here, right in the front. Uh, this is a terrific session. I hope that the committee will edit a volume based on it and perhaps persuade all of you to do your memoirs on the subjects covered. It's really great. But my question concerns the future. Uh, Xi Jinping says we're going to have a new kind of relationship, or we should. And we're all wondering, what's the content of that going to be? Uh, China and the U.S. are leading the world in struggling with so many issues, whether you talk about economics or politics or international human rights or whatever. Are there going to be accepted rules of the game in the future? Will that be the new U.S.-China form of relationship? Will China accept rules of the game? And will we? And this comes up whether you talk about the South China Sea or you talk about the WTO or international human rights. Everybody talks international law. But are the nations involved, led by these two great powers, willing really to subject their views to impartial adjudication, arbitration, etc. That's what's at stake in the plaintiff Philippine effort to defend itself by going to the United Nations Tribunal System on the Law of the Sea. They're looking for a rule-based world, not one based on coercion and force, whether by the United States or China. I'd love to hear your thoughts based on your diverse experience. Volunteers? Win? State? Well, Win? Start with Win. Okay. China. First, a footnote on the Chinese language. I had a Chinese language wife, and she was a tremendous asset interpreting culture as well as getting out among the Chinese, so that saved me to a great extent. Uh, and I've done a 1,400-page oral history memoir, so you can consult that. Uh, you put your finger on a crucial question, the future of our relationship. Uh, I don't think neither we nor the Chinese have really defined this new major power relationship. If it means escaping the Thucydides trap of established powers not going to war with rising powers, and I forget the scorecard, but it's about 11 out of 15 they have gone to war, uh, then of course we have to agree with that. There's no inevitable conflict between us and China, and we have to work 
to avoid that. And that, that's one way to define it. It's a little constricted way. It's minimal, but it's important. If it means, at least from the Chinese standpoint, we have certain core interests, including 80% of the South China Sea, uh, and you accept our core interests as part of our new major power relationship, that's another story. So we're going to have to work this out. Uh, but above all, we've got to strike a balance, to get to your question, of China having a stake and being a constructive part of the international order, but also recognizing that they have a right to have greater influence in that order, greater representation, and even help shape it. So if they want to help shape uh, the international order and work for international law and order along the ways that it's established its stability over the years, that's one thing. If they want to upend it, then we're going to have trouble. So that's, that's a key question in our relationship. I'm optimistic despite near-term frictions, uh, but there's no question uh, the jury is still out. State bad word. Uh, my comments parallel those of, um, uh, of Wynn. Countries go to war who aren't established powers and rising powers. In other words, wars occur between countries. So avoiding conflict uh, is part of what diplomacy is all about. But the rising power versus established power syndrome is a particularly difficult one. And the concept of this new type of great power relationship is specifically designed to address the problem that strategic rivalry between the United States and China is increasing, even as areas of cooperation between us expand. And that is a pernicious cycle. Because when defense establishments on each side are preparing for conflict with the other as the principal likely opponent, it creates a dynamic internally in each government that becomes difficult for leaders to manage. And you need positive efforts to try to offset that. And that's what it's all about. The way the Chinese define it is not exactly the language that we use, but they use a four-part four expression. No conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, not for core interests, meaning treat each other as equals, really, and mutual benefit. But other countries in Asia are worried about this because they think it's some sort of G2 arrangement. You don't have to be a rising power and you don't have to be an established power in order to want to see rules governing the conduct of various parties. For example, China and the 10 countries of Southeast Asia in 2002 signed a declaration on the conduct of parties in the South China Sea, which established the principles that if the various parties had abided by them, you would not have the current tensions in the South China Sea. They included avoiding and prov provocative actions, settling disputes peacefully, uh, no uh, coercion. Uh, it, it was a wonderful list. And one of the provisions was that they would turn it into a binding code of conduct. So that's an example where it's not just the United States and China. Rules by which countries are prepared to play are an important part of stabilizing an international order. Now, you raised a very important question. Are we prepared to abide by such rules? And is China? And the answer is not unless there are checks and balances. We have a very imperfect record in living up to undertakings that we have taken on. And China is being driven by domestic factors now into, for example, the principal contradiction China is facing right now is they recognize they can't achieve the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which is the way they define the Chinese dream, except in a peaceful environment. But at the same time, the second part of their dream is to uphold China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And yet they have territorial disputes with a host of countries around their borders. There's a fundamental contradiction there. And the question is, is China going to be able to manage that contradiction successfully? We have contradictions on our side. For example, we think Japan should take on a greater defense role in East Asia, and our ally South Korea doesn't like that for historical reasons shared by China. So these are the types of issues that have to be managed between us and China, but also between us and our allies and friends in the region. So there's, I think there's no magic content 
to this idea that can somehow make it work or not make it work. But it is important that we keep a strategic view of the types of rivalries that are emerging in the region. For example, I would argue that Sino-Japanese relations show no sign of strategic thinking on either side. And we see the same problem in the US and European and Russian relations right now in Europe. The strategic question is, what sort of relationship do we want Russia to have with Europe? And are our actions designed to produce an outcome that is compatible with longer term peace and stability in the region? Or are our actions simply driving China and Russia closer together? We have to, our policies in other words, have to show some indication that we have a strategy behind them. And I'm concerned that globally right now, we see the great powers of the world behaving in ways that do not show a strategic sense of how we can produce a more peaceful and prosperous world. We're letting the passions of the moment drive us in various directions. This is dangerous, and we need new types of great power relations in order to deal with that problem. Mm -hmm. All the way in the back, in the yeah, red. Steve. Oh, well, well, let, like, let um, Admiral let me Let me add a little bit, because I, uh, Jerry, the, a, a couple of things. I think uh, what Stape has talked about is a, almost a pure nation state system. And I, we, we, have, we do have wars going on that are amongst entities that are not represented by states. And so those are more complex. And they, you know, you have uh, marauders that are terrorist groups and others that don't abide by a, a nation state system. So this is a, this is a complexity. That does not exist in the U.S.-China relationship, however, but there are, there are those kinds of wars as well. The, um, a, a point I think is, is worth mentioning is for the U.S. and China to work well together, they, it would be much better if they both had a lot of confidence in their own nations and a lot of uh, coherent foreign policy. And lack of a coherent foreign policy, which I think you alluded to pretty thoroughly, is, is a problem for us. Where do all these pieces fit in the, in the system? And then, without wanking about it too much, we need to, in, in our country, our foreign policy is driven by our internal domestic politics, as is China's. And so, I, I think uh, our actions toward China uh, are looked at a lot through the prism of how does it affect elections in the United States, how does it affect individual elections, and until we can get a little beyond that, I think working the great power relationship will take second seat. John now has I, something. I, I would just build on this very quickly by, by saying that um, we, have, we have to start practicing what we preach in order to really develop a meaningful strategy that will, that will actually be listened to. Uh, on the other side. So we're sitting here in a building having this conference in the New York Stock Exchange that thinks in terms of quarterly increments. That's what we as Americans do. And this is one of the biggest disconnects in even developing a longer term strategy. So if we were meeting in China, we'd be in the Renmin Da Hui Tang. We'd be in the Great Hall of the People, thinking in terms of centuries. So how do you take a culture that thinks in terms of the long game and America that thinks quarterly and begin to fashion a strategy around that, particularly when you've got political dysfunction here, which makes it very difficult. And as Wang Qishan told me during one break of a negotiation we were having in China, we also have politics here in, in China, you know, and they're becoming ever complicated. And the rise of the state-owned enterprise are creating a level of special interest politics that really has never existed before in China. So how you get beyond just the barriers to entry to begin developing a longer term strategy is a real issue that I think we're gonna have to come to grips with at, at some level. But finally, I'll just say, Jerry, because you have been such a leader in this area for which you were greatly respected. And that is, I think the gains over the next few years could very well be in the area of rule of law. And I think we have a huge opportunity as a country in fortifying and capacity building around the notion of rule of law, however, defined by Xi Jinping, and how that then begins to lead to aspects of civil society. 
which I think we might see a little bit of over the next 10 years, which would be a very, very good thing, and it would represent some real progress between the two of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead, in the back. Good. Well, my question is about, um, about the recent DOJ's indictment against five Chinese military officers. Do you think this is a constructive way to solve the cyber security issues <coughs> with China in terms of its timing and its impact on the uh, bilateral relationship? Uh, also, we know that the Chinese government has already suspended the activities of the China-US Cyber Working Group. So how should the US government respond to this action? And what's your advice for the two countries to solve this problem to maintain a good relationship, particularly for the US side, since John we work for the US government? <laughs> John authored a, a report along with mm -hmm. one of our other directors, Denny Blair, on just this subject. Well, I would, I would argue that for 40 years, China has been systematically stealing our intellectual property. So let's not confuse espionage with the theft of intellectual property. We're confusing the two in many of our conversations. And because of that, I don't think the American people are getting the full flavor of simply <coughs> the damage done when you rip off innovation, trade secrets, and good ideas that result in jobs and creating the industries of tomorrow. Uh, so for 40 years, I think we've had a problem. I think it was, it, 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 it was ratcheted up considerably about eight years ago with the early onset of, uh, of, uh, of uh, innovation uh, preferences in China uh, that really created some serious stumbling blocks for American corporations. Uh, and I can at least trace back uh, eight years the systematic cyber poking and intrusions that have really resulted in a, in a lot of theft. I'm quite frankly surprised that more hasn't been done in the years running up to today. Now, will five people who have been now taken after by the Department of Justice result in much uh, through legal channels? I can't imagine that it will because we don't have an extradition treaty and there's no way that you're ever gonna see trial. But will it ratchet up the level of debate on intellectual property theft as separate an, an issue separate and aside from espionage, which countries do to each other? Uh, and I'm not sure there's anything you can do about that over the short term. Let's put that in a separate category. But intellectual property theft, I think, is a very real issue that we have to work on in our relationship because the American business community has reached the 212 degree boiling point. I've never seen that before. And they're willing now to get very specific about certain intellectual property uh, cases uh, that they've kind of stayed quiet about because they've all done reasonably well in the China market. And this could prove to be very, very fairly damaging to our long-term economic prospects. And if we don't do something about it, I suspect that some of the measures that we outlined in our report last year, which go from using you know, Section 337 of the Trade Act, which is blocking goods that, are, that come through our borders that consist of, by way of supply chain or direct manufacturing, uh, 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 stolen uh, uh, technology, right on through to denying services from our banking system to those companies that have been involved in intellectual property theft. I think this is an issue that could get very, very hot if we don't begin speaking in terms of practical solutions and a roadmap toward resolving it. Other question? Um, Terrific answer, John. Right over here, yep. I can't quite see. Very good. Hi, I'm Albert Golson from the Overseas Press Club. Um, could you just um, give an insight into the region uh, with respect to whether you feel China feels or will begin to feel encircled? Because for the first time historically, you have a strong China, a strong Japan, um, and then you have a completely new regime in, in India, which really uh, could change the whole dynamics of the region. And uh, going back to Japan, the so-called reinterpretation of Article 9, what are the unique challenges um, in this new dynamic? And again, the question of encirclement. I'll take it. Well, I know that obviously many people in China and many people in the Chinese government feel that the U.S. policy is to contain, encircle, or restrict the growth, prosperity, and the rise of China. The U.S. government, of course, has been saying that's not our intent. Uh, our engagement in Asia is because of how significant all of Asia is, 
uh, to America's interest and to the future of the world economy when you have almost 60% of the world's GDP, including the United States and the Asia Pacific Rim. And of course, America has long had a, a presence of going back more than 100 years in the Asia Pacific region. And we actually feel that our presence uh, our military presence uh, uh, and our economic presence has really provided stability by which so many of the other countries of the Southeast Asia and the Asia-Pacific Asia region uh, have been able to prosper. Um, and, uh, but nonetheless, I think China has that view that there are many uh, Western countries trying to restrict the growth, the prosperity, the rise of China. But at the same time, while China has disputes with many of its neighbors, they're also trying to form trade agreements uh, with these other countries. Uh, disputes with Japan, disputes with Korea, uh, disputes with the Philippines and Southeast Asian countries, and yet China's trying to put together a lot of trade agreements, free trade agreements, uh, uh, to uh, uh, solidify their economic uh, in interdependence. Uh, and so uh, there's a political issue, but there's also the economic reality. Let me, we're going to need to close because we're, we're at the bewitching hour. But let me ask you, if you were, you're sitting as ambassador um, last month, uh, what would you have said to the president as he hopscotched around China? Would you have made the argument, you know, as he went to Japan, you know, as he's 90 minutes from Beijing, it's four or five hours of his time. John has argued that presidential visits are not worth, that there's such a downside to <clears throat> presidential visits, it's not worth it. But as if the five of you were still ambassador and you saw this was going to happen, now you wouldn't have known they were going to tow a rig because that happened subsequent to it, or maybe our intelligence knew it in advance, but that there was a deterioration in the relationship that was occurring. Would you have argued forcefully back to Washington that he should stop in Beijing for four or five hours to see President Xi? The answer is no. First of all, he's going to Beijing in November. Secondly, there's no law that says every time you go to Asia, you've got to go to Beijing. Thirdly, I would have advised the president to do what I think he tried to do, to stress two things. One, reassuring our friends and allies, at the same time reassuring China that we want a positive relationship. Uh, that's a tricky uh, double-header to pull off, but I think he tried to articulate that. I think he succeeded on the first on the whole in the region. I don't think the Chinese were convinced on the second. We can't do containment because it's impossible. The countries don't want to choose between us and China. Uh, we don't want to do containment because we have many common interests and we want to avoid conflict and we want to cooperate on these global and regional uh, problems. There is a danger that China will contain itself. If they keep doing the kind of things they've been doing on these maritime disputes, uh, they're going to have this strategic disconnect that State uh, mentioned earlier on the one hand, they have historical grievances, territorial and resource and sovereignty issues, so they're pushing the envelope in some of these disputes. But in so doing, for short-term tactical gains, they are creating the kind of alliances, the calls for US presence, the increased military deployments and budgets, precisely the aspects of containment which they don't want to see. Steve? I completely agree with Ambassador Lord. Um, Very wise man here. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, the, the president won't be able to visit uh, Asia if he has to include China every time he goes there. Uh, what do we say to our allies? If, if I, I, th I thought it was wh what I saw in the president's visit. And don't forget that the president has missed a couple of meetings he should have been at in Asia. And one of the key purposes of our rebalancing strategy is to convince the East Asians that even though we have the image of a declining country, that we have the will and the resources to maintain our presence in East Asia. Because that means that China can continue to rise without destabilizing the region. And so he included key allies in his visit and key non-allies. Yeah. That's why it was as important. If I'm asking the question as ambassador. Would you have been arguing that he should make that stop? Would it make your no, life easier? The answer is no. Okay. I, I think it would have much, it was much more important for him to include South Korea than for him to include it's Beijing. It's not an either and or state. It's four hours out of his time. He was 90 minutes from Steve, Beijing. Don't, I, don't forget that last May, the president did something he has not done with any other leader in the world, or early June. He spent over eight hours of substantive conversation with Xi Jinping of China. 
That's the type of dialogue we need to continue with China, not quick presidential visits of the sort that uh, Ambassador Huntsman has correctly said don't accomplish a whole lot. I agree with Lord Roy. <laughs> <laughs> And I agree with Ambassador Lord Roy. <laughs> <laughs> I agree a, a four or five hour visit would not have done much. And uh, again, you know, the president went to Southeast Asia, to countries that he missed when he was not part of the APEC meeting. Sure. And that created controversy there. And so he needed to Just show like the commitment of the United States government to those countries. Yeah. And uh, when we're dealing with North Korea, Japan and, and, and South Korea are so important. And finally, as, as uh, the others said, the president will be in China for several days this coming fall uh, during the APEC meeting, which is hosted by China, and will probably include a official state visit attached to that as well. So four or five hours, what can you really get other than a photo op? You can't really get meaningful discussion, conversation. And so it was, I would not have recommended that he stop off in China. It would have diluted the conversation and the impact in terms of the relationship building and the messaging with our allies. But to, to just end on Stapes' point, that substantive dialogue and conversation, one of the reasons these state visits have become such a high wire act is because we do them so infrequently. Uh, and when we do it, you know, you've got every saddle burr that has built up over years. I mean, the president has been to Beijing once in six years. Uh, you know, these di the dialogue ought to be routine, it should be consistent, it should be focused on a strategy that is built upon conversation after conversation, visit after visit, so we don't have a one for six year cycle where everything just falls flat. Maybe I uh, represent the Lao Bai Xing, but in my view is if you're, if, you're for, if you're 90 minutes from Beijing, in fact for exactly that purpose, to make it regular, to not make it a front page story, to have a discussion of what's going on, maybe we could have avoided some of the problems that are occurring today just by we're aware of what's going to happen, we'll have a discussion at the highest level and see if we can, we can avoid some of those problems. So but I, Steve, I, re remember I, that the Central Kingdom is about 90, mile, uh, 90 minutes from most of the capitals of Asia. So when he's Asia. in Asia, well, we have um, reached the bewitching hour and I just want to, this has been a fabulous, fabulous discussion. It is. <laughs> I just, I just want to thank you on behalf of the National Committee and thank you for your extraordinary service to our country. It is all deeply appreciated. Thanks. Thank you.